All right, we're going to continue reading who was George Washington Carver. And then just to remember, to remind ourselves, on the beginning he took um, the new position of going to Tuskegee and being in charge of agriculture. And he had his students go on nature walks and with discovery kits, just like we do. He helped the poor farmers with their farms. And at the end, we knew that he made pamphlets and got up super early to start his day. So we're going to continue from there. All right. Then he taught four and five classes each day. He also ran the experiment station and worked in the homemade laboratory. He continued to paint and draw too, and he often wrote letters to Moses and Susan Carver and to other families he had lived with. So if you remember, Moses and Susan were his uh, white owners in the beginning of the story. He also organized a Bible study class once a week. His intense workload and many interests left George little time for fun. Sometimes his friends set him up on dates, but he never married. In 1906, George designed the G Soup Agriculture Wagon. Mm, and we learned about this the last time. It was a mobile classroom and portable laboratory. The G, the G Soup Wagon was named for a New York banker, Morgan Moore, Morris J. G. Soup, who helped pay for it. A former student of George was in charge of taking the wagon to faraway farmers who couldn't make it to Tuskegee. The wagon was loaded with soil, seeds, booklets, and many other study materials. In 1908, George had the chance to visit Moses, remember that was his um, white owner, his father, who had moved to Kansas after Susan's death several years earlier. It would be the last time George saw his foster father. Moses Carver died in his late 90s in 1910. Let's keep going. Five years after losing his father, George also lost his friend, Booker T. Washington. And if you remember Booker T., he's the one that made the school for uh, um, black students. Let's see what happens. Booker was not 59 when he died of heart failure in 1915. George and Booker didn't always agree on how things should be run at Tuskegee, but they were very close friends. I am sure Mr. Washington never knew how much I loved him and the cause for which he gave his life, George wrote another friend. Booker T. Washington has been the face of the Tuskegee Institute since the school opened its doors. After his death, Robert Russa Morton became pres president of Tuskegee, but it was George who became the most famous person at the school. Right. And then chapter seven, peanuts. Ooh, this is what I was waiting for. Well, at Tuskegee, George liked to tell a story about a talk he once had with God. What? Mr. Creator, why did you make the universe? George asked. Little man, the question is too big for you. God answered, try another. So George asked, Mr. Creator, why did you make man? God answered, little man, that question is still too big for you. Try another. This time, George asked, Mr. Creator, why did you make the peanut? And God said, little man, that question is just your size. You listen and I will teach you. Apparently, George was a good listener because... Because while experimenting at Tuskegee, he began to develop more than 300 products that could be made from the peanut. These, they included everything from peanut milk to peanut punch, plastic, glue, soap, and dye. Peanuts were considered so lowy, that means very insignificant and useless, that before George began to study them, they were mostly used for animal food. Farmers couldn't make much money from peanuts and had little reason to grow them. But it looks like George figured out how important peanuts are. Cotton had been the main crop, that means the main plant, in the American South. But in the early 1900s, it cost some farmers more to grow cotton than they could sell it for. The bull weevil is a type of beetle, this one that feeds on the cotton buds and can destroy the entire crops, came to the United States from Mexico in the late 1800s. In 1910, and arrived in Alabama. 
After many years of studying soil, George knew that planting cotton over and over again sucked the nutrients, the substance that plants need to grow out of the soil. He wanted farmers to rotate their crops. That means to take turns. That meant growing cotton one season, but then switching to a different crop the next. Then they, would, then they could replant cotton the season after. One of the crops George recommended for cotton grows was the sweet potato. Ooh, sweet potatoes are awesome. They're so delicious. Sweet potato plants are easy to grow. Oh, we should grow that one next year. And crops could be stored during winter months. They could they were good for soil and they were and they could be eaten many different ways. Some of George's early bulletins were on the sweet potato. George also experimented with cowpeas, sugar beets, rice, soybeans, uh, alafal, alafal? Wow, never heard of that one. And more. His experiments helped him understand the best way to grow these crops so that they could yield the most food. He learned what kinds of soils and growing conditions they needed. In 1910, Tuskegee built George a modern laboratory to replace his homemade one. And by 1915, his experiments were taking so much of his time that he began to give up teaching. All right, we're going to stop there. So I want you to think what happened in the beginning, middle, and the end of what you just read. And I think next time we might even finish the book because we're on the last chapter.